Um, he went on, so in addition to this, he claimed that he personally knew Amir, he said he knew him well, and that he knew him for 10 to 12 years at this point. <laughs> but if that was true, you know, all this information, he got completely wrong. So he said that he was a crip bodyguard that drove around Compton in a stretch white limo. He used a machine gun to kill Biggie. He also claimed that Amir was, uh, before he joined the Nation of Islam or the Fruits of Islam, he was named Kiki or Kenny, which Amir Muhammad was named Harry Billups. So, you know, if you know someone well for 10 or 12 years, you would think you would at least know what their real name was, um, but maybe not. But anyways, he also claimed that Amir Muhammad was between 6'1 and 6'2, that he weighed between 220, 230 pounds. Amir Muhammad, AKA Harry Billups, uh, he was 5'11", and he weighed around 180 pounds. So he's, you know, three inches off on the height. He's, what, 40, 50 pounds off on the weight. Doesn't know the first name of this guy that he claims he knows really well. Um, he also claimed, let's see here, that, um, you know, detectives asked him what kind of gun was used to kill Biggie. He, again, you know, said it was a machine gun. When the detectives asked him if he knew what caliber was used, he said, I heard a machine gun. It could have been an Uzi or a Tech 9. I don't know. Then the detectives asked him, do you know how the shooters did it? How did they get away? And he responded with, he went around the corner and got in a limo or a truck or something and drove off. So this guy that they're getting the name Amir from to base their whole theory on, he doesn't even know that Biggie was killed in a drive-by shooting. He thinks that the killer shot Biggie on foot and then ran and hopped in a getaway vehicle around the corner and drove off. So, you know, in addition, during this interview, he told police that he didn't know if the shooter acted alone and that he didn't even know where exactly Biggie was killed. He just knew that it was at a party somewhere. And, you know, he also admitted that it was hearsay. During the initial interview, he said that he was just, it was all hearsay stuff he had heard around the jail. So basically they have this guy, Psycho Mike, who gives them a ton of information None of it matches with Harry Billups, a.k.a. Amir Muhammad. At the time, Harry Billups was a real estate broker that was living in, near San Diego, California. So this doesn't match a crip bodyguard that is driving around Compton. You know, in, in the, and I don't know if this was a, an error on whoever made these notes, um, but these were notes that appeared to have been written by the detectives during their meetings. They wrote Frequence 83rd Street in Compton. From talking to Reggie, there is no 83rd Street in Compton. The streets start like up in like 150th or something like that. So basically, you know, just all this information is completely wrong. He gets the guy's name wrong. He gets his height wrong. He gets his weight wrong. He gets the description of the vehicle wrong that was used, a limo or a truck. It, it was actually an Impala. He gets how the shooter did it. He thinks it happened on foot. He gets that wrong. He says it was a machine gun. That doesn't match up with any of the eyewitness accounts. You know, basically he got every single thing wrong and admitted that it was just hearsay, but detectives cherry picked the name Amir and ran with it. Would you agree if there was no Psycho Mike, there wouldn't be any of uh, this? Or what do you think? Yeah, hundred percent. And that, like, if you look at those FBI documents that he's posted, that are being posted, the, the redacted ones, then ask yourself, well, who are these sources? Who are the people that are being referred to here? Well, one of them is obviously Eugene Deal, and then the other one is Michael Robinson. And Michael Robinson, like, I'm good friends with the guy that was handling him, um, an FBI agent named Tim Flaherty. And he was Michael Robinson's handler. And even Tim will tell you, man, hey, listen, that, he's a very problematic informant. He did provide good information on occasions, but he was a clinically diagnosed schizophrenic and he suffered from severe schizophrenia and when he went off his medicine shit the whole world was you know after him helicopters and i mean this was the delusional mind that he lived in when he was off his medications and he never you know when when cycle mike gets interviewed he's he's basically um uh, uh, trying to provide information to law enforcement in order to justify the payments that are being made to him by the FBI. So now he's in jail with another guy named Wayman Anderson. They're two snitches in the snitch module at the county jail, and they begin to collaborate and how to figure out a way to um, pro provide information to law enforcement that would benefit them. And that's all Michael Robinson was doing. You know, but his own handler will tell you.
No, he's lying about that. Of course he was. <laughs> he was, you know, and... and well, if, you know, if he's talking about Amir Muhammad, he got the physical description wrong. He said that he was a Southside Crip that hung around in Compton. I think he said he was like a PCP dealer or something like that. Pretty much everything about Amir Muhammad is the complete opposite of the person he described. So... <laughs> A hundred percent. All the criteria that he states in in trying to identify Amir Muhammad is abs- is completely opposite of the real Amir Muhammad. So good point. Right. So yeah. Gr- have you ever heard and, of anybody and then, he, and then you know he finally stepped up, and you know that's what happened after his deposition. He went running out of the office. He went in the other room. He started to cry. And he ran out of the office and, you know, he had a meltdown because he knew he was lying and he didn't want to do that. At heart, Michael Robinson was a good person. He just suffered from a really severe mental disorder and, uh, and he felt really guilty about it. And, you know, you talk to his handler, you talk to Tim Flaherty and he'll, ex- he'll explain exactly what was happening with Michael Robinson at the time. Have you heard anybody in Compton or any blood members ever say that they knew David Matt? Not a single one. Um, I had an informant that um, that we put in the Montebello City Jail when David Mack was there because we were trying to figure out whether or not um, we could figure out where the money was that he had stolen. And uh, so I put this informant named Benny Keys in one of the cells with David and he just said that nothing ever came from it. Um, but no, not a single blood um, from, especially from Looters Park or Ma Piru that knew David Mack. Um, and nobody at death row knew David Mack. Um, so, yeah. Because you can't find any pictures of all the pictures online or anywhere. You cannot find any pictures of this so called uh, David Mack and Perez being that. Uh, death row party that is the craziest thing that there's no evidence of that and right. I, I've never even seen evidence that really links uh, Kevin Gaines to David Mack and Perez no, it's true. no the only connection was obviously that uh, Kevin Gaines was dating Shug's ex-wife or estranged wife at the time Sharitha um, but that was it that's kind of the extent of any LAPD connection other than a guy named um, Kevin McCauley, who was moonlighting working for Reggie Wright Jr. until he got caught and he was fired. And uh, that was it. So basically just that one picture that you see of him in that red suit is basically like the only thing that can really say, and I, that's not even enough to call somebody a gang member. I just don't, I never saw the correlation to a competent gang member because everything I knew or read about him was he was like like you can you can even go on youtube and see like track meets and stuff with him in it i never i don't see what the correlation was to him being a gang member with death row and nobody's ever said they grew up with him or knew him it, exactly it's exactly right and once you realize that michael Rob, once you take amir muhammad out of the equation once you accept the fact that michael robinson was lying then if there's no Amir Muhammad, then there's no connection, there's no David Mack. And so the whole thing just, you know, dissipates into thin air once you accept, once you realize that uh, the whole, the foundation fell apart with Michael Robinson. Right. That's crazy because there was a lot of, from what I read up on, like people that were getting paid off in the LAPD that they put behind bars. And people these days are all about a quick dollar and there was never anybody to come up and try to make false accusations just to try to get some lawsuit money or anything. So I don't even see how that was even. No, no, no. Well, you know what? You bring up a great point. That's why we talked about Kevin Hackey because Kevin Hackey was one of the guys who lied and said, yeah, I need to, you know, David Mack and see, I saw him at death row parties. And of course, once he's asked to testify to that, once he's subpoenaed to court and he knows he's going to go up there and perjure himself, that's when he's like, oh man, I got amnesia. I'm afraid for my life. I don't remember shit. It's like, oh yeah, because you don't want to take the stand and and perjure yourself, which you would have had to have done if you kept your, if you were going to continue to make those claims. And that's why he called, you know, he, he eventually reached out to Reggie Wright and apologized. Right. And he said, hey man, I'm sorry for fucking shit I said and putting you in the middle of all this and you know 
God bless him for that, but he needs to publicly come out and do the right thing, which is to say, you know, um, that he was falsely accusing people. Absolutely. Right. And from these FBI documents I was reading today, it looks like that he was one of the informants because there's a part in there that mentions that the gun used to kill Tupac was confiscated from the death row event at six at uh, House of Blues. That same story he's told, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it just, you know, it goes to show because Gene, I know uh, AG was saying he's kind of changed his belief on the Tupac murder now, but this this FBI document. Gene has said before that he believes Southside is responsible for Tupac's murder. Whether it's Orlando or not, he believes Southside did it. So yes. he doesn't believe, obviously, what this FBI document says about the Tupac murder, about it being Suge Knight that did it. So why is he going to choose to believe what it says about the Biggie murder, but not about the Tupac murder? Like, he's going to cherry pick which parts of these documents he wants to believe and then try to make it fit, you know? Yeah. It fit, fit the narrative, yeah, exactly. Which is, I think, what he's accusing me of doing, which is ironic. <laughs> <laughs> do you, um, yeah. yeah, I don't know, man. Um, but, yeah. Retracky hacky. Yeah, retracky hacky. That's what you know, uh, that he used to call him. This is something, and if you don't want to answer this, you don't have to. It's personal. It might be too personal. Uh, Amir Muhammad, but there's a, a big conspiracy theory going around that to kind of paint him as this person that's capable of murder, that his wife had an affair on him and then she ended up dead like a year later and then her boyfriend was murdered a year after that or like some some crazy story like that. Do you know if there's any truth to any of that? Uh, well, kind of, yeah. So what happened with Amir, you know, he was, he was in love with this girl and she broke up and she started to see another guy and Amir kind of um, got into a for lack of a better term, a road rage incident with the guy. And the guy claimed that Amir had flashed a gun. And so this was, this all actually did happen, but it was over this, over this girl. And in, in, in Amir's very upfront, I'm sorry, Harry Billups, I should probably refer to him by his real name. Um, Harry Billups was very upfront about it. You know, he, he explained in detail exactly what was um, happening between, you know, him and, uh, in that situation, so it was never something he was trying to hide. But just because you get into some argument over a girl, does that now mean you're capable of killing somebody? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're, they're and, it, and then, and then, of course, to raise the question, because the girl and the boy, the girlfriend and the new boyfriend, end up, you know, in a, in a suicide pack, and they are killed in front of witnesses. But yet, oh, gotcha. they're going to wow. shoot. Yeah, like literally. Um, the thing was witnessed and okay. it had nothing to do with Amir Muhammad, but yet because it fits their narrative, they're going to be like, oh, isn't this suspicious that all of a sudden they're dead and Amir Muhammad must have <laughs> Right. They've, like, they've always left that part out. I've never heard about the witness thing. They always conveniently leave that little part out of it. Oh, no. Yeah, no. It was clearly, it was an open and shut case. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah. Right. And like you said, though, I mean, just because someone has done something before doesn't mean that that, that basically does not any evidence at all for him to commit a murder years later or whenever it happened. And, that and, 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 and let's, let's just even say, let's just for the sake of argument, say that he was capable of that. Still doesn't mean he did it. Right. Right. You've got to have evidence and you have to be able to connect the dots and you can't do that with him. And regardless of, it, of whether he's capable of it or not, I'm probably, you know, I'm capable. I've shot people. Right. Does, you know, does that mean I've... You know, uh, uh, does that mean I'm a cold-blooded murderer? Right. That was a horrible example, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I get what you're saying. Murder. Like, if someone has, you know, like if there's a gang member, just because they've murdered someone in the past doesn't mean they're responsible for this murder over here. You've right. got to have evidence to connect them to that specific crime or else you've right. got nothing. There you go. You say it better than I did. <laughs> Greg's a murderer. <laughs> hey, so, so what's it like to talk to Amir? I mean, Harry Bellup, I'm sorry. Does he have any, I know, does he have any interest of uh, speaking out publicly one day or is he not? You know, uh, according to him, he's, he's, he, he's torn by it all. You know, he's like, I don't want to even bring it up. He goes, I've suffered through that thing. I'm so far you know, I'm so far uh, removed from it. And he goes, but every time I entertain the idea of 
you know, going on, you know, glad or whatever. Right. Um, his wife talks him out of it. She says, nope, it ain't happening. We ain't doing that. You're going to just continue to live your life and you're not going to get mixed up to all that money shit because it's just going to raise problems. Uh, and right. so, yeah. But I'll tell you, he's an extremely um, intelligent, articulate man. And, uh, you know, you listen to him and uh, you see the effect that all of this has had on his life. And it's its its, its own tragedy. Has he told you any... Um any stories like does he get harassed or you know what I mean like any, anything like that um it, it affected his workplace you know just the just the reality of being accused of something so horrific is it, you know obviously it's going to make you feel um that everybody's looking at you right and, even though and they might so, not yeah. say it yeah yeah, and so. even if he did, even if he did come out and try to clear his name on Vlad or whatever, it probably wouldn't make a difference anyway. The people that believe that wouldn't believe him. You know, they're going to believe what they want to believe anyway. That's that's. I think that's the point his wife tries to make too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. So it doesn't accomplish much, but um, yeah. Do you think it's a coincidence that we're doing this interview on March ninth? Oh yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> you know what? I didn't even I, I, about. An hour and a half ago, I got a text from my old partner, Darren Dupree, going, hey, Greg, you know, it's the anniversary. And I was like, yes, of course it is, man. And, uh, but now that you mentioned it again, I, it, uh, yeah, it's, I guess that's yeah. special. Yeah. Have you talked to Miss yeah. Wallace at all? Uh, um, again, I know you talked to her once, but I'm not sure if you guys reconnected or do you have any interest to re reconnect with her? With Valetta? Yeah. Oh, you know, I would always be happy to, to speak with her. She's she's just a wonderful woman. But I really leave that up to Darren since he's still on the job and he's the advocate for that case now. And so Darren does stay in touch with her. He maintains uh, communications with her. And because I'm retired and kind of removed from it all, I, I just uh, I don't think it's my place to continue to reach out to her. Right. So Darren's still a detective or a, a police officer? Yeah, he's a he's a detective supervisor at Robbery Homicide Division still. I think he's got three more years left before he retires. Oh, nice. Yeah. Does um no. go ahead. Um, geez, I just forgot my question. Um, that is crazy though. Twenty three years today. I I had forgotten about. It. I hadn't really paid attention to the date, but that's wild. Twenty three years. Do you guys, uh, you and Miss uh, Miss Wallace, is there any um because the way uh, unsolved. Uh, did it dramatized it that it was like she she you guys had a like a very uh intense conversation but kind of left on a bad note like she was telling you to leave then... um so i've only met her once in person and that was at her house in um, pennsylvania and my wife and i drove over there and uh, we flew into new york and rented a car and then drove over and we sat down and she invited us in and of course, it was prearranged. She knew I was going to come visit her. And we sat down and I just explained to her everything that I knew and how we came to the conclusions that we came to. And I just remember um, at one point, I, I made a comment about a clue that came into the case. And it says, you know, investigators need to talk to DMACC. And it was D-M-A-C-C. -C. And uh, of course, that was always twisted to mean David Mack. And mm. I explained to her, I go, no, DMAC was Darius Rogers, right? Who's an associate of Bad Boy. And uh, that was what the clue was, that somebody's thinking that maybe he would know something. And she, I remember her just putting her hand up, like, you know, her, like a stop sign, like towards me, like put her hand up, like, I just don't think I want to hear anymore. And she began to weep. And then, of course, I was emotionally affected by it. And I right. began to, to cry. And then my wife starts crying. And we're all just sitting there, like, crying over how, hor how horribly misinterpreted information had been and how much um, how much she had been um, misinformed about things in her own case. And I think she that was what was so disturbing was that she has come to this realization like all of this information that I've been said for years is bullshit and I wasted so much time and energy um, I think that that's what that emotional response was, and I it, it affected me too. Um, 
because she put a lot of time and effort and grief into a false narrative. And, and that's a hard pill to swallow. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was an honor. I mean, Ron, it was just, it was an honor. You know, you take all your cases seriously and you hope that you can accomplish what you set out to accomplish. Unfortunately, in that case, even though we got to the truth, it wasn't satisfying to the public. And, um, but it was an honor to work on both of those cases and meet some incredible people on that journey too, you know? Um, and also some really, really fucking horrible people. You know, there's just some really terrible people surrounding this case. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, again, guys, go to It's AGTV on YouTube. That's the homie, and uh, he's got a great YouTube channel. It's your number one cowboy, Chinks, and you're watching AGTV.